background about Farhad. He was born in Kabul, Afghanistan, and raised there until the age of six. And whereupon his family migrated to Punta, Pakistan, uh, because of safety concerns. And his father and older brother insisted on Farhad and his younger siblings to continue with their education, even though the family was not in their native country. And even though they were living in areas of Quinta that were not very safe and which were extremely poor. And so Farhad was able to finish middle school and he attended an English language center and he worked at a local pharmacy in Pakistan. And in fact, I am quite envious of your education because your English is better than mine. And so Farhad also, in addition to English, speaks four other languages. Uh, his native language, which is Pashto, Dari, and Farsi, and Urda, and English. He's quite accomplished uh, linguist. After the U.S. Army had invaded Afghanistan, his family returned to Kandahar, and that was in 2002. And at the age of 16, Farhad was appointed as an instructor of a computer software and hardware at the newly established Computer Institute for one year. Um, while attending high school in Afghanistan, he worked for two years as an interpreter and translator for the U.S. Army in Afghanistan to help minimize the misunderstandings between Afghanis and the U.S. Army. And during this time, he graduated from high school in Afghanistan, uh, in Kandahar in 2005. And then with his friend Mike, Mike uh, Manaton, he came to the United States in 2006 in pursuit of his higher education. And in June of 2008, he graduated from Portland Community College with an Associate of Science degree with the highest academic honors. He was awarded several scholarships while he was there, and he was also the first student to receive an International Student Key Note Speaker Award. Fortunately for us, his higher education experiences didn't end in Portland because he transferred in 2008 after completing Portland Community College to Oregon State University to begin a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology. And he also was a member of the Honors College. He was awarded an International Cultural Service Program Scholarship, which we know as the ICSP Scholarship, for educating people on the situation in Afghanistan. He also conducted research for his undergraduate honors thesis and fortunately, he conducted his research in my research program as an undergraduate. His research as an undergraduate for his honors thesis was um, investigating diarrheal diseases in rural villages in the outskirts of Kabul. He completed his research and defended his undergraduate honors thesis, which is titled, Presence of Diarrhea and Its Intensity Due to Human Behaviors in Kabul, Afghanistan. At this time, he was awarded several scholarships from the College of Science. Uh, he graduated with his biology degree from Oregon State University, and he graduated with honors. His compelling life story, as well as his successes at Oregon State University as an undergraduate, was one of four student stories selected by Oregon State University's President Ray to share at graduation commencement. So that's quite the honor. In 2010, he was accepted into the graduate program in the Department of Microbiology at Oregon State University, and he was awarded a graduate research assistant in my research program to pursue his Master's of Science degree in microbiology. In addition to his research efforts, he has also served the department as a teaching assistant, and upon successful defense of his master's thesis today, which is entitled, The Role of Salmonella Typhimurium Type 3 Secretion System, T3SS and effector proteins in chromatophore cell response. On completion of this today, Farhad will continue his graduate studies in a PhD graduate program in molecular and cellular biosciences at Oregon Health and Science University of Portland, Oregon this fall. Farhad, it's been my extreme honor to serve as your research mentor over these almost five years you have endured with me. It's a long time, isn't it? It represents almost one-fifth of your young life, doesn't it? So that's a pretty long time. And um, I want to say that um, in my 24 years of training students here at OSU, he is one of the most remarkable students that have ever 
graced my research program. You have accomplished so much in such little time that I'm sure you're going to accomplish so much more with what's left in your lifetime, a very long life. Um, he will have an enormous impact on people's lives and to realize the sacrifices that Farhad and his family have made so that Farhad could be with us and is to really understand the depth of their commitment to education and family and the level of faith and integrity that makes up the foundation of your family. So it gives me great pleasure to turn over this stage to you and to get me off of here and to listen to your accomplishments today. So so much to me for the kind introduction. I hope I don't let you down in the rest of this presentation. So today I'll present to you um, introduction, experimental design results, conclusion, and wrap it up with the further studies. Food burn analysis are prime concern each um, around the world. Each year in the United States, 48 million food analysis are reported. About 128,000 food analysis are uh, hospital people are, are hospitalized, and about 5,000 people die. These number are this number uh, correspond to only 17 percent of the U.S. population. Considering uh, it's remarkable, considering that the U.S. food supply is considered one of the safest in the world. Bacterial contaminated food and water are the major contributors to global diarrheal diseases. Now, but some of the bacteria species of prime concern worldwide are some another species, the cell series, E. coli that produce toxin, uh, Listeria, Clostridium, Shigella species, and many more. Food burn analysis are treatable and preventable in most cases if detected early. About two-thirds of the research is dedicated to developing pathogen detection applications for food industries, clinical diagnosis, water, and environmental quality control. Culturing and, count, uh, and colony counting is one of the oldest detection methods. Um, however, these, uh, this detection method takes uh, a lot of time and it doesn't tell us much about the organism. Uh, Immunology-based methods such as ELISA it, um, it takes specific proteins in a sample. But again, the downside of this method is that it does not tell us if an organism is alive or its toxicity. Molecular-based methods such as PCR polymerase chain reaction they detect uh, DNA fragments. But it, again, this detection method needs. Uh, a known nucleic acid sequence for primers. And it does not tell us about the organism if it is alive or its toxicity, it just tells us about its presence. Bioaces, such as whole animal models, are also used in detection methods, but again, it brings up the ethical issues and it's also costly. Current detection methods uh, have in insufficiency so, uh, and that they require specific targets and higher sensitivity. Uh, the biosensors have become the main focus of the research. Biosensor devices that utilizes biological materials such as cells, tissues, organelles, microorganisms, and cell receptors for detection. Especially cell based biosensor um, have, uh, can address those insufficiencies and in, um, those older methods, in that they don't require specific uh, targets, and also they are able to physiologically respond to uh, biological and chemical toxicants. Among the cell-based biosensors, promoter for cell biosensors have shown great potential in that they can rapidly, uh, uh, rapidly respond physiologically to biological and chemical uh, toxicants. The physiological responses, again, observable under microscope. A little bit more about the chromophore cells now. Chromophore cells are pigmented and light reflecting cells that are present in fish, amphibians, and cephalopods. There are varieties of pigment colors among the chromophore cells. Um, 
brown to black are called melanophores, uh, orange to red are called the erythrophores, and yellow to orange are called the xanthophores. This picture represents all three uh, type of the uh, type of chromophore cells that are isolated from the beta splendid red beta splendid fish. Now, this diagram represents a chromophore cell, a normal chromophore cell. The red dots represent the pigment organelles in the chromophore cell that move along the microtubules and act in filaments. Now, this this diagram represents a chromophore cell that is exposed to a neurotransmitter clonidine for about 20 minutes. The pigment organelle, the clonidine causes the pigment organelles to move along its microtubules, its microtubules, and uh, the active filaments toward the center of the cell. Now, the cell will look, uh, after 20 minutes, it will look like a black dot under the microscope. However, the cell does not change its shape. It's because this pigment organ has moved toward the center of the cell and makes the cell look smaller. In previous studies in Trumpy's research program, the chromophore cell response was tested to these agents. Today, I'm going to focus on the bacteria and the bacterial toxins. Uh, the, the, this is the list of bacteria and bacterial toxins that induces response in the chromophore cells. And this study will focus on the erythrophore cell response on salmonella type media. So now a little bit about salmonella. Salmonella is, one, uh, is a gram-negative, rod-shaped uh, pathogen. It is facultative and aerobic. It has flagella that is used for mortality, and they have several different types of stereotypes. Salmonella is one of the most common cause of foodborne illnesses around the world. Globally, each year, about 94 million cases of gastroenteritis are reported, and about 155,000 people die. In the United States, non-typhoid salmonella species causes more than 1 million foodborne illnesses, about 20,000 hospitalizations, and about 400 deaths. So, and the estimated annual economic loss is about 3.3 billion dollar in the United States. Salmonella is one of the most successful bacteria pathogen in that it can cause foodborne illness in developed, developing, and third world countries. Salmonella is again one of the best studied bacterial pathogens for, and for the last two decades, the focus of the research has been the type 3 secretion system and effector proteins. Type 3 secretion system and effector proteins are essential components of invading mechanism of salmonella to invade the cell. Now, a lot has been known about salmonella pathogenicity. Here, I will briefly uh, talk about some of the virulence factors that, uh, that are relevant to this study. The diagram demonstrates this diagram demonstrates the entry of salmonella typhimera into a polymorphonuclear leukocyte cell. Salmonella, path salmonella turns on salmonella pathogenicity island one as a cluster of virulent gene that encodes the type 3 secretion system, needle-like apparatus, which is used to secrete the effector proteins into the whole cell. Now, during the time course of the invasion, about more than 30 effector proteins are secreted. Here, I will just talk about a few that are relevant to the study again. So, these effector proteins work in a concert to facilitate the involvement of salmonella into the whole cell. Sub E2, sub, for example, some of the effector proteins, such as sub E2, sub B, acts on other proteins in the host uh, and result, that results in acting rearrangement and remodeling. Other effector proteins, such as CYP A, that directly binds to the active filament and causes the uh, active filament rearrangement and modeling, remodeling. Once salmonella is involved into, this, into the cell, salmonella, salmonella turns on salmonella pathogenicity island 2, another cluster of variable gene that encodes the type 3 secretion system 2 needle like apparatus to secrete more effective proteins into the cell such as SPTP that is involved in salmonella survival inside the host. In a previous study by Stephanie Dukovic, uh, 
she asked some questions like, do better split the sort of for cell respond to some another type of area? And she determined that in her study that they do, yes, they do respond. And then she asked, can this be optimized? And again, yes, she showed uh, that it can be optimized. And then she asked, what bacterial products are involved in stimulating this uh, response in the four cells? Um, to answer this question, she metagenized some another type of medium using the EZTN5 transposome kit. She screened a number of mutants and found a few that did not induce a response in the Earth 4 cell. She further investigated the SC10 mutant and she found that uh, she found an interrupted promoter region between the minus 10 and minus 35, a helium box sequence of operon PRJJK, which is responsible for encoding the type 3 secretion system 1 beta like apparatus that is used to um, secrete the effector proteins into the cell. I chose to investigate why another mutant that she screened, ST10, was not able to induce a response in the RT4 cell. So I hypothesized that the mutation in ST10 resides in either gene or genes coding for the response for the process regulating expression of the PRJJK operon or the gene or genes coding for the effective proteins that travel through the PRJJK apparatus. And I also have a hypothesis that the effective proteins of the type 3 sequential system are components of salmonella type medium and beta mechanism directly involved in inducing pigment organelles to under undergo an aggregation response in the earth for cells. The first objective uh, was of this study was to address the first part of the hypothesis character to characterize the ST10 mutant using the rate PCR to identify disrupted gene or genes and then clone and complement the disrupted gene or genes. The second research objective was to answer what is the role of salmonella type medium, type 3 secretion system effector proteins and the erythro 4 cells response. So I character, to answer that question, I characterized the erythro 4 cell response to salmonella type medium strains containing mutation in CIP-A, sub e sub e 2 and SPTP type system system effector proteins. Now a little bit about the experimental design. Erythro-4 cells were isolated from the red beta splendid, uh, splendid fish and culture and tissue culture plates. They, were, they are first washed with scanning solution which removed the surface epithelial cells and then they are digested with uh, collagenase and hyaluronidase enzymes uh, which releases the chromorophor cells from the tissues and placed in the tissue culture plate. After two or three days, when they are ready for the experiments, they are exposed to control and experimental agents. Images are taken at different time points and, points and processed into Excel using Image Pro Plus software to measure percent pigment area change. Before each experiment, the erythro 4 cells uh, physiological response was uh, assessed by exposing them to neurotransmitters, clonidine and alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, or MSH, and LB. The y-axis represents the change in pigment area percent and the x-axis represents the time and minute. Each time point represents an image processed and analyzed using the Excel and Image Pro software. Blue line illustrates the erythro 4 cell response to quantity. The, and the, the blue line illustrates the erythro 4 cell's response to quantity by aggregating the pigment organelles to the center of the cell. Now, this aggregation response induced by, uh, induced by quantity is mathematically described as negative percent pigment area change. The, the red line illustrates the retroforcer response to MSH by dispersing the pigment organelles to, uh, to the edges of the cell. And this uh, dispersion caused by the MSH is mathematically described as positive, uh, did not induce much of uh, pigment 
uh, organism movement and the relative force self. The images and the zero minute panel corresponds to zero minute on the graph, zero minute point on the graph, and the images under the 60 minute panel represents the 68 minute on the graph. This graph shows the relative force of response to white types of vanilla type medium and some another type of medium, ST10, mutant. The orange line illustrates the relative force of response to white types of vanilla type of medium. And pigment organelles in the force cells move to the center of the uh, to the center of the cell in response to wild type salmonella, as expected. The purple line illustrates the relative force cell response to uh, ST10 mutant. ST10 mutant. The ST10 mutant did not cause pigment organelle move, movement in the force cells similar to the to the wild type. So these results suggest that the mutation in the ST10 is impacting the way the pigment organelle, uh, pigment organelles move in erythrophore cells in response to salmonella. So using uh, rate PCR and sequencing, it was identified that the transposome, the transposome was inserted into um, in the middle of healthy gene at amino acid 220. Now it is clear that the on, that only healthy gene was interrupted by the transposome. Uh, healthy gene is a major transcription regulator for salmonella pathogenicidal pathogenicidae one. I will discuss the regulation of healthy in the later slide. To see if the SC10 mutant will regain the ability to cause pigment movement in the erythrophore cell. It was, um, it was complemented with a copy of wild type healthy gene. Using specific primers, a copy of wild type healthy, a complete copy of healthy was cloned with a uh, fur, uh, fur box, up, upstream fur box regulator. And then it was, comp, uh, it was cloned, ligated in a low copy number vector and then transformed an ST10 mutant. And a low, uh, an empty copy of the vector was also transformed into ST10 mutant as control. This graph shows the the erythrophore force cell response to wild types of another type medium, ST10 mutant, ST10 plus the empty vector, and ST10 plus the copy of LD. The orange line illustrates the erythrophore force cell response to wild types of another type medium. The the purple line illustrates the relative force cell response to uh, mutant ST10, and the blue line illustrates the relative force cell response to ST10 plus the MT uh, vector, which is similar to ST10 mutant. The red line illustrates this red line illustrates the relative force cell response to salmonella type medium ST10 mutant plus the copy of LD. So relative force cell response to salmonella type of medium ST10 mutant containing a copy of the wild type LD gene did not show response to wild type as to wild type salmonella type medium, which led me to question my experimental design and let it go more than the 60 minutes. This graph shows the force response to some wild type salmonella type medium, ST10 mutant, ST10 mutant plus the empty vector, and ST10 and complemented ST10. The orange line again illustrates the relative force cell response to wild type salmonella type medium. The purple line illustrates the relative force cell response to mutant ST10. And the blue line illustrates the relative force cell response to ST10 plus the um, empty vector, which again, their, their response is similar to the uh, ST10 mutant. The red line illustrates the relative force cell response to uh, Salmonella type of medium mutant ST10 plus the copy of wild type um, healthy gene. Here, the erythrophore cells response to ST10 mutant containing copy of wild type healthy gene showed similar response to wild type salmonella type of medium, but however, it was not the same. So, which led me to ask the question that why was healthy function not fully restored? upon complementation. There are several possibilities. One, maybe for uh, partial for box B was not enough or sufficient for correct regulation and expression of LD. 
recent studies have shown that a for, for a for a box uh, upstream of the for b box is essential to correct regulation and expression of the healthy gene. Second, were there too many copies of PLD? I used a low copy number of uh, vector or plasmid, but there still would be three to five um, of copy of PLD gene and the complemented ST10 mutant. And third, as the diagram, the diagram shows that the complexity of how PLD is highly regulated by other transcription uh, regulators. PLD um, activates the hel A. Uh, the hell aging, which in turn activates then the salmonella um, pathogen CDR1. Hell D, RTSA, and hell C, the transcription regulator, co regulates each other and they can all, uh, and they can all regulate the hell A. And also, hell D is repressed by global regulator HN, HNS, and then hell D is iron regulated too. So therefore, it might be difficult to complement healthy phenotype through a simple complementation. The second part of my study is asking what is the role of some type of mutant catfish system in vector proteins and their erythrophore cell response. To answer this question, erythrophore cell response was characterized to some strains containing mutations in the genes coding for CYP-A, SOP-B, SOP-E2, and SPTP effector proteins. However, these mutations, these mutations were created in a salmonella type layer strain more than isolate. So to see if there is any difference between the erythrophore cell response to salmonella type medium bovine isolate and salmonella type medium human isolate, the both strain, uh, erythrophore cells were exposed to each of uh, each one of those both strains. The blue line illustrates the erythrophore cell response to salmonella type medium bovine isolate, and the orange line illustrates the, some, the erythrophore cell response to uh, salmonella type medium human isolate. Even though the erythrophore cell response to salmonella type medium bovine isolate is a little bit delayed, but both of the strains, uh, both of this, this, both of the erythrophore cells. Uh, completely aggregated by 78 minutes to both of the strains. This graph shows the erythrophore cell response to uh, salmonella type medium bovine isolate, salmonella type medium with mutations and effector proteins SOP E2, CYP A, or SPTP genes. The light blue the light blue line illustrates the erythrophore cell response to salmonella type medium bovine isolate. The orange line illustrates the erythrophore cell response to sub E2 mutant. The dark blue line illustrates the erythrophore cell response to CYP A mutant. And the red line illustrates the erythrophore cell response to um, salmonella type medium SBTP mutant. These results show that the mutation in sub, sub E2, CYP A, and SBTP do not impact the pigment organelle movement in the erythrophore cells. This graph shows the erythrophore cell response to salmonella type medium bovine isolate and salmonella type medium with mutations and effector proteins in SOP B, CYP A, or SOP B uh, mutants. The blue line illustrates the erythrophore cell response to salmonella. This blue line illustrates the erythrophore cell response to salmonella type medium bovine isolate. The light green line illustrates the erythrophore cell response to SARP mutant, and the purple line illustrates the erythrophore cell response to CYP-A SARP double mutant. These results show illustrates that the mutation in SARP B, CYP-A, and SARP B did not uh, changes the way pigment organelles move the in the erythrophore cells. Now, these results have shown that. Uh, shown that the CYP A, the dark blue line, the CYP A mutant did not change the way pigment organelles moved in the erythrophore cells. So these results suggest that the, 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 the changes in the way pigment organelles moved in the erythrophore cells is solely because of the mutation in uh, SOP B gene. SOP B is an effector protein that is involved in acting remodeling 
and uh, to facilitate the involvement of the bacteria into the host cell. This is a hypothetical model, a model to summarize the finding of this study and previous study of erythrophoresol response to some other type of media. This study, uh, this, this study demonstrated that fully expressed and regulated LD gene, uh, fully expressed and regulated LD gene, a major regulator for salmonella pathogenicity island 1, uh, is important to salmonella type medium to induce an aggregation in the other four cells. Previous studies have demonstrated that the PRJJK operon that is responsible for encoding the type 3 secretion system needle like apparatus which is used to secrete the effector proteins into the host cell is important to some another type of medium to induce the aggregation uh, response in the four cells. In this study also, uh, have demonstrated that direct, the direct role of SARP effector protein and some another type of medium uh, mechanisms to induce aggregations in the four cells. In conclusion, pigment organelles movement leading to an aggregation and erythrophore cells is altered to respond to some other type of medium uh, LD mutant. Mutations in cell E2, CYP A, SPTP genes in some other type of medium did not alter the erythrophore cell response. Erythrophore cell response. However, mutation in cell B gene in some other type of medium altered the erythrophore cell response. This is the first evidence in support of a direct role of some other type of medium sub the effector protein and pigment organelle movement leading to an aggregation and the four cells. Further studies, investigation of effector proteins such as CYP-C and CYP-D will increase understanding and potentially reveal their involvement in pigment aggregation of the resplendence of the four cells. Collectively answering, answering why and how the four cells respond to some other type of medium will result in better understanding as to how to use this cell type as a biosensor for bacterial toxicity. Now, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Janine Trumpy for really believing in me and for giving me the chance to conduct research in her lab. Uh, I would like to thank each one of my committee members, um, Dr. Martin Schuster, Dr. Bruce Keller and Dr. Jerry Heidel. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Karen Derrickson, and it was a true privilege to work with her in the lab, and it was amazing. She was, I'm going to go off what I wrote because <laughs> I, I didn't know what to write because she's one of the kindest women I've met. Um, she has patience. Um, I'm not going to talk about her knowledge because it's too much, it's, it's way beyond my words to explain how much knowledge she has of her scientific things, I would say. <laughs> but uh, but I, I'm just, I, I'm, I, I don't have enough words to express my feelings and gratitude for her. I'd like to Oh, this thank you thing is very hard to do. <laughs> now I'm getting nervous. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Department of Microbiology and really the staff, each one, Mary, Sally, Cindy, uh, Bonnie, and Dana. They were most amazing and kind people to work with. Most amazing things that I will go take with me is working with them and how kind they were with with everything. And I would like to thank Dr. Gary Adams at Texas A&M University uh, for providing me uh, the mutants, the specific picture mutants. I would like to thank my lab members, Roberto Garcia. She's, he has been, <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say, this is the hardest part. <laughs> he is, uh, he's been a really good friend and a very good supporter in the lab. Um, sometimes I get frustrated because they haven't calmed me down and helped me with all the food and making choices in life, actually. Um, I would like to thank Holly Roach. Um, some of you might remember her. She graduated last year. I would like to thank Dr. Stephanie Dukovic again for her um, living 
some of the mutants that I work with in the lab. Uh, my American family, really, uh, Mike Middleton, he's not here today, but truly I'm here today because of him, and so I would like to thank him in his absence. Uh, Julie de Leon, she's uh, there with her son, and I met her seven years ago. She supported me and loved me for who I am, you know, annoying and telling bad jokes and all those kind of things. But for seven years she has been my friend, so thanks for that, Lori. And really all of my friends, some of them came from Bands, some of them came from Portland, some from here. I would have put each one of you here, but I don't think if I can do that in one slide. <laughs> Kevin might help me, but he wasn't available. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank my family in Afghanistan for really giving me the permission to um, be here and pursue my, um, my education. I would have loved them to be here, but um, they're always me, always. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and thank you. Um. Thank you all. Please grab some food on your way out. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for